Well, let's not let's not dwell on the misery of your. No. Let's move to your second match, which was, as you said, a uh, slightly bigger stadium. Uh, twenty nine and a half thousand were there. Uh, tell us about your second game at Ellen Road. Yeah, a, a very different experience. Um, I, again, I must have been pestering. I, I want to go to a big game. I want to go to a big game. And, and um, Leeds played Manchester City. Um, and again, uh, uh, hazy memories of it, but one that is imprinted on my mind. And this was 1979. So this was probably the peak era of hooliganism in this country. Mm. Um, now, fortunate enough, I didn't get caught up in any of that. But I do remember as we went around the ground going to our seat in, I think it was the Lowfield Road stand. Um, Leeds fans uh, coming towards us. And I remember one time, anyone want to buy a scarf? Anyone want a scarf? And in, they ha in their hands, they had tatters of a Manchester City scarf that had been ripped to pieces. And okay. presumably so had the poor soul who originally had owned it. Um, I'm sorry, that, that stamped on my memory as, oh, this is a bit different. This doesn't happen, Dan, Dan Boothan. Um, so yeah, that, that that was a little bit different, and then I also seem to remember, and I might be mistaken here. I've not looked it up. I know, I know, City won two one. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Michael Robinson scored one of the goals. God rest him. Who who went on to? Well, he, he was he, he was a good player, and he went on to become a really good player for you know for City, for QPR, for Liverpool, for Brighton, and, and for the Republic of Ireland, and then and then a great yeah. TV pundit in Spain in Spanish, absolutely, um, yeah. and, and sadly passed away a few years ago. Um, so Michael Robinson was one of those sort of pin-up heroes of mine as a kid. Um, Michael Robinson did play. Unfortunately for you, he didn't score. He didn't score. Uh, there you go. No. So, me. yeah, Leeds, uh, Hankin scored for Leeds and Paul Power and Dana. Uh, who was one, Dana. Of the, one of the first, wow. pretty much the first European player to come. I mean, I know there were a few beforehand, but because of the Polish performance in the 1978 yeah. World Cup when they came third, they they were you know suddenly saying oh we need to get some Polish players in and obviously yeah. we got our dealers and via from Argentina. But, uh, the minute, the minute and, and he unfortunately name. died, didn't he? he yeah, he did in yeah. a car he, crash only yeah. about ten years later. He did and the minute you said his name, I started racking my brain. Hang on, where where did I know all about Kazmierz Dana from? And that would have been from Top Trumps, from World Cup Top Trumps. Yes, that, that's, yes. That, that, that instantly, I, I could see the card. As soon as you said his name, I could see the card. Yeah. And one of the players actually for Leeds, uh, worth pointing out, is Paul Maidley, who is making his 500th league appearance. 500th. And he actually managed to rack up over 700 overall. So, you know, he was... Um, he was about 35, which, you know, in, in modern day, that's not so bad. You know, Thiago Silva's pushing 40, but he retired at the end. And the one other player who stood out for me when I was looking at the lineups was Steve Daly for Man City. Because yeah. if you yeah. remember, he was the second million pound player and yeah. didn't really kick in as, as people would expect it. Because it was Alisson was the manager at City yeah. and he'd spent quite a lot of money trying to get City to where they, they used to be and that they had struggled, actually. So um, it's always interesting for me to see what Alisson did before he came to Palace and after yeah. he, he left Palace. That, that was but, around um, the time as well, wasn't it? I, I remember the old programme that, that was kind of the forerunner of what is now the One Show, Nationwide. Yeah. They had a like, series on City yes. at yeah, the yeah. time, um, which I can remember as a kid sort of being fascinated by. So it's the first time any of us had really seen the inner workings of a football club. And, and not only that, City at the time, a pretty dysfunctional football club. Yes. So, um, yeah, that, that that stuck in the mind. I think you can find those now. If you do a search, you can find the odd episode of that. Yeah, so City Till I Die was actually, you know, uh, had its forerunner many, many decades before uh, yeah. they did that. Um, and I, I do want to point this out. I, I don't usually go on about Palace too much, but <laughs> on the 29th of September 1979, when Leeds lost 2-1 at home to Man City, Palace beat Ipswich 4-1 and went to the top of the first division. Marvellous. It lasted a week. That was the team of the 80s. You know, it's very we still in the 70s. Exactly, yeah. A team yeah. of the 80s. We were going to be, you know, dominant for a decade. Unfortunately, it lasted a week and then we disappeared off the face of the earth pretty much. And I would, I would imagine but, Vince Hilaire played that day who later went on to play for Leeds. 
Indeed, yeah, there, there are always connections. And uh, were you a program collector guy? Was that something you got into early? Um, or le- not? Not then. Not then. Later, later on, I was. And, and funnily enough, I, I'm, I'm patron of a charity, the Sporting Memories Network. And a few oh, years yes, ago, I, I went into my mum. My mum passed away, and that, so I went into the loft of our old house and retrieved boxes and boxes of programs from all my life, basically, and. I gave them to the to the charity and 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 they've been distributed all over the place, um, which are great for our meetings that we hold with, with people with mm-hmm. Alzheimer's, people with loneliness issues, and they go and sit down, have a coffee, debate sport for two hours, and it, it, uh, they're they're brilliant things to do. It's what we're doing now, basically. They're, they're yes. brilliant things to do. Um, so yeah, that, I, I I did start collecting programs. There was a bloke down the pub where my dad used to go for a drink of an evening, who was a massive Everton fan, and he used to bring back an Everton program. Every time he'd been to a home game, which was every home game, and this was in the eighties when they were the best team in the country, um, the yeah, Howard yeah. Kendall team. So that was when I started sort of collecting programs. I, I had every Everton program for about three seasons. Um, wow, they've now gone, but um, some of them are probably worth a bit now. Yeah, uh, well, I've got a, a little surprise for you. I've actually located the oh, Leeds brilliant. program, so I'm going to get that sent to you. Oh, thank so you. you. That's- you can put that in your loft. Well, you um, know what? That that will go alongside. I'm going to put that on the wall in here because that can go great. alongside. Um, somebody very kindly also located a few years ago. I know we haven't talked about it yet, but the second York game I went to, which was my eighth birthday, mm. York v Portsmouth, that same season. Yes. So I've got that programme as well. So that, that that's okay. great. I did try and track down the York Peterborough programme, but I didn't go <laughs> far enough. Out of print. Uh, but if anyone out there has got York uh, Peterborough uh, guy would be absolutely love well, to have If it was that. Peter Lorimer's debut, I would imagine there's a little bit of value on that as well. Of course, of course. But we're not here for value. We're here for the memories. Um, York Portsmouth, let's move on to that. So this was uh, your eighth birthday party on the dot, I think, yeah. 16th of February, 1980, uh, and turned out to be a little bit more enjoyable than Peterborough. Mm, one nil win. Um, yeah. Now then, did Kevin Randall get the goal? I think. He certainly played. Uh, he did play. I'm afraid yeah. it was Derek Hood. Derek Hood. Oh, I should have known that. I should Come have on. He, a, a club legend. Absolute club legend. Yeah, Derek Hood. Yeah, oh, I should have known that. Yeah, yeah. he played in every position. Midfield, fullback. He, really good player and a really nice man as well, Derek. Um, yeah, mm. North Easterner. Um, absolutely great bloke. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that was yeah one nil win, and my abiding memory of that one is like me and three friends, or maybe four friends. My dad took us all. We did sit sit in the popular stand that day, um, and my abiding memory of that is, as, as I said, I used to I used to bother people by asking questions all the time. I met Malcolm Huntington that day, who my dad knew really well, and who was the senior sports writer at the local press, and as I mentioned, a Wimbledon umpire. And I remember my dad sort of introducing me to him, and, and subconsciously. The questions I asked and what he told me, it may well have sown the seeds for where I am now and, and, and for what I'm doing. Um, yeah. I, I do remember a conversation with him. Um, I also remember asking him and asking my dad who I should look for on the Portsmouth team. And they had in goal uh, Peter Meller, who was a very Correct, distinctive yeah. looking chap with a shock of blonde hair. Mm-hmm. And it was pointed out to me that he had played for Fulham in the cup final against West Ham four years previously, and which I yeah. don't remember because I was only three. Um, right. But I guess that was my first football fact that I'd sort of asked about and ingested and been told about. So that yeah, yeah. That, that, that that's my body memory of that game. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? That sort of he did have a shock of blonde hair. I do remember him very well. And uh, funny enough, my first game was Palace Leeds uh, in the late sixties, and the one player who stood out was Billy Bremner because he had yeah. such red hair. Yeah. Also, he was very angry. He kept <laughs> shouting and, you know, castigating people. And I was right up on the, you know, the boards, right yeah. back. I thought, oh, he, he, we need to avoid him. We're not going to, we're not going to stop him having a toffee because he's, he's going to be trouble. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, actually, again, when you research these things, that Portsmouth are actually going for promotion. So this was fairly pretty, you know, Towards the end of the season, because it's mid-February, they'd beaten York in the pre- pre- the league fixture at Fratton Park, and York had managed to concede three penalties, which you don't do that often. No. Um, you had to work and, to get a penalty in 1979 and 1980. Exactly, you had to hack someone's leg off, pretty much. <laughs> um, but 
so it was a great result for York and in the local press, which again, thank you very much for Paul Bowes for sending it to me, that, you know, it's almost as though you've won the FA Cup final. It's everything's <laughs> turned round. Derek Hood is the hero. He apparently smashed it in from over 100 yards or whatever it might be. But it, it's just really, it's lovely to read things like the local press and just get a, a real feel for yeah. the change in atmosphere. And Laura who was playing and, you know, they... Say so he he did well, and you know he kept Portsmouth at bay. But you know, glad to hear they you know they turned it round and they did survive. Portsmouth actually did go up that season, but York survived and didn't have to go through the horrible re-election yeah. stuff. Which again, the youngsters won't understand what we're talking about there. No, that was that was basically if you were in the bottom, well, as you say, bottom four. I know it was bottom two for a while. It and changed. Yeah, you have to apply to the football league to keep your place in the league at the expense of the team that had finished top of what is now the National League. Um, but I think it was called the Alliance Premier or something back then. Um, yeah. And and, and 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 it was always a bit of a fudge because the chairman all knew each other and over a cloud of pipes yeah. smoke or cigar smoke and a brandy or two, it was, don't worry, old chap, we'll keep we'll keep you in the club. So, so you're, you're benefited from that for quite a few seasons, actually. Yeah, it was, it was you know, it was the classic would turkeys vote for Christmas because you knew the teams around there would go, we could be there next season. Yeah. Let's do them a favour. So I, I think I think was... famously, I think Altrincham were the team that were unlucky and denied quite a few times. Um, I think you're right. Yeah. But they're, 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 never mind A. Eh? <laughs> yeah. I would do that. Uh, and they've never made it into the football league Altrincham, have they? So, which is um, you know, must uh oh, but they're a much better team than York are right now. So there we go. Okay. Right, we've got, so them, let's got them to, uh, as we speak. We've got them tonight, actually. Oh, good, really? Okay. <laughs> well, keep fingers crossed for that one. Um, so we're going to move away from you know we don't want to be too parochial and just talk about York and Leeds and you know Yorkshire. There, there are other places in this world, and yeah, not I'd like nice to go. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to move to your first international match, which uh, obviously would be a great. Comp- uh, contrast to going to Booth and Crescent or even possibly going to Ellen Road. So uh, talk to us about your first international game. That that was many years later. Um, I'd mm. been to Wembley once before then um, on a family trip to London. We had squeezed tickets to see Tottenham against Liverpool in the Charity Shield in 1981. Um, mm. And so I'd been to Wembley once only. Now, by the time it, we get to 1993, I'm 21 years old and I'm working for a brief time in the city for a Dutch bank, ABN AMRO. Um, oh, yes. Very brief, very brief um, because I very quickly realised, actually, after about two days in the job, that this wasn't <laughs> for me. This um, yeah. Actually, it was my first day in the job, I realised, when I was packing up at six o'clock to go to Cricket Nets for a team I'd just joined in Essex. And was told in no uncertain terms, you don't leave until the work is done, even though I had done it. And so I had to sit there and I thought, well, this isn't for me. I'm not doing this at the expense of something I really want to do. So um, there we go. That's by the by. Um, but while I was there, I did go. I went to Wembley three times in a very short space of time, actually. And the first, I think it was the first of the three, uh, was for England against Holland, which was a, a qualifier of some sort. I'm thinking it must have been for the European Championships of 92. No, it was it's World like, Cup. Was it World uh, Oh, no, 93, 94. Yeah. No, yeah. The, the disastrous qualifying campaign, 94. Yeah, yeah. 90, yeah. and um, England against Netherlands, 2-2 draw. Uh, I remember the chant at the time was, you'll never beat Des Walker. He was the paciest centre-back in the world. And then Mark Overmars basically did, repeatedly. Yes. Um, yes. Quickest player we'd ever seen at that point. Um, and there was a very early goal that I almost missed. I was walking down the steps to my seat when it went in. Right. Um, now, John Barnes, score? second. John minute. Barnes, John Barnes. It was John Barnes. Yeah, we did score it, and then, yeah, um, yeah, that was that was good. That was um, finished work. Went there um, a, a night under the lights at Wembley to watch your country play. Yeah, I've been lucky enough to have been to many, many England internationals since. Um, yeah, but that was that was a good one, and that was that was just before I started doing this for a living. It was sort of um, yeah, literally just before, and and that same sort of time of year. I went with a mate who came down to see me. We went to the Sheffield Wednesday Arsenal FA Cup replay. Mm-hmm. Um, and we also, FA Cup final replay, I should say. And we all, and then at the end of the season, York City went up to the third division on penalties, beating Crew Alexandra. So I, I became a Wembley regular from that point on. 
Oh, well, it's, it's always go, good to go to a playoff final uh, yeah. and win it. So uh, back to England, then, you, you said, it's interesting you say that Des Walker chant, because actually, as you say, Overmars ripped him a few mm. times. And unfortunately, I think it was Overmars who was brought down by Des Walker mm. in the 87th minute when Netherlands equalised. So we went 2-0 up when I say we, sorry, I mean England, Platt scored in about the 25th minute, then Bergkamp got one back for half time. And as I say, Des Walker, who never, ever, ever got beaten for pace, no. was completely ripped, brought yeah. him down, penalty, two all. And of course, this was the match where Valters uh, took out Gascoigne and broke his cheekbone with the elbow. Yeah. And, and I do remember this quite clearly. I think he was one of the first people to wear a mask. Yes. I know it's quite a regular yes. thing now to protect your cheekbone or whatever it might be. Oh, the, the Phantom of the Opera headlines. And the everything. Phantom of the Opera, exactly yeah. what it was. It, it looked like yeah. he'd actually been borrowed. He'd gone down the West End and borrowed it because it just yeah. didn't look particularly medical, did it? It looked no, it, more it, it operatic. Didn't. It didn't. And, and thinking, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking on top of it, that must have been the same campaign that the return fixture in Rotterdam would have been the great Greg exactly Taylor right. de Dumont yeah. and the, he's going to flip one, he's going to flip one. And, and he yeah. did flip one, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it was also my first experience of seeing the virtually incomparable Dennis Bergkamp in the flesh as well. And what, mm. what a footballer, what a player. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you, when I've spoken to a few commentators in the last few weeks about their first experience of watching games. And in in that England team, I'm sure you, you probably um, shared commentary duties with, you know, the likes of Martin Keown and Lee Dixon. And there they were in that first England yeah. game. And, and yeah. is it a little bit odd then to have them alongside you and working with you? You know, I, I, it's not something I think about. Um, but when I do, it's quite nice actually to stop and think about yeah. it. I think these these players were borderline my heroes, and and now I'm lucky mm. enough to call them friends, um, you know, yeah, colleagues and friends in many cases. And you know, I work a lot, for example. Well, I work with Martin a heck of a lot. I love Martin to bits. Mm. And also Clive Allen, um, and Clive oh, was one of my big heroes as a kid. And when he got 49 goals in a season, goodness me, you know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. an incredible feat. And now I, I I talk to Clive all the time, and I. I I, I have ribbed him on occasion. I say, it's a bit weird when I used to have your picture on my bedroom wall. It's a bit odd. <laughs> I think I'm kind of just rubbing it in as a bit older, really. But um, yeah, it is, it's it's really lovely. And, you know, that old adage about never meet your heroes, absolute load of rubbish. I can't recall ever being disappointed. That, that's good to hear. A um, couple of other questions, uh, and you may not remember these that clearly, but you're... Can you remember your first ever TV commentary match? Because we had a little chat beforehand and you said the Liverpool Palace game coming up will be, did you say your 1300th for the BBC? The BBC television, yeah. So it's BBC well over 2,000 um, in total. Uh, not, not for television, but well over 2,000 commentaries in total. Um, but um, yeah. Um, can, you, can you remember your first TV commentary game? I don't, Probably I don't. Um, I remember my first one for Match of the Day in 2004, and that right. was Aston Villa beating Southampton at home 2-0. Um, David O'Leary and Paul Sturrock were the managers. And Darius Vassell and Carlton Cole got the goals. Um, okay. And that, that was my first BBC Match of the Day commentary when they got the rights back from ITV. I was I was at ITV during the days of the Premiership, um, which was a very underrated programme, actually. Once you got past the teething problems at the start, editorially, there was nothing wrong with it. Um, so I'm quite proud of my work on that. I can't remember the first game I did for it, however, having said wow. that. Um, I remember the first game I covered as a reporter, which was York-Brentford in October 93, so later on, 93, when it all started to happen. Yeah. Um, I remember my first actual commentary, which was 93, night to be March 94, and that was Leeds against Aston Villa, at Elland Road for club call. 2-0 yeah. Leeds win under the lights on a Wednesday night at Elland Road. Mm -hmm. um, but my first actual TV commentary would have been for Eurosport in 96 or 97. 97, possibly. Yeah. And I can't remember it. It would have been off tube. It would have been done from a studio in Paris. Um, it would have been either a European game or an international game. Uh, and I can't remember what it was. I do remember... The, was it the first time? No, it wasn't the first time. Um, that same season, 97, 98, it was all building up to the World Cup in France, of which Eurosport mm -hmm. were a major, one of the host broadcasters, yeah. um, being a French-based company and part of TFO. 
So um, I was down to cover it for them with my first ever World Cup as a commentator. And I did and I enjoyed every moment of it and remember a lot of that. Um, so we started, the, the, we got out to one or two games actually in the flesh, which they didn't do much at Eurosport because they tended to secure rights sort of on the hoof, ad hoc, a game here, a game there. Um, but I went to watch Leicester City against Atletico Madrid for them in the UEFA Cup that year. Um okay. I, I I got to Celta Vigo. I got to Atletico Madrid, the Vicente Calderon, the old stadium there. Uh, and I remember at the end of '98, before the World Cup, one of the first games I went to cover a TV live, live for television was mm -hmm. the Spanish Cup final in Valencia. Oh. Wow. Um, and Barcelona under Louis Van Gaal beat Hector Coupe's Real Mallorca on penalties after a one-one right. draw. And and that was that was a wonderful experience. Um, the the steep stands of the Mestalla. Yeah. I, yeah, I still yeah. I don't think I've been to a stadium steeper than that still in my life. Um, yeah. And it's the only time I've been to the Mestalla. Actually, I've not been there since. Uh, oh, no, did I? I might have done. I might have covered Leeds there in the Champions League. Um, right. But it, yeah, the, I, I don't. I don't actually massively remember my first TV commentary. I think probably because it was in a in a studio in a cupboard. Yes, um, so, it's not there are many... particularly memorable being in the box. No, there, there are many of those over the years because um, I say many. Luckily, the BBC we don't do that generally. We, you know, we're always at the ground. So, um, but I, I, I hear clips of games from the past in the late nineties, early noughties, and I hear clips, and it's my commentary, and I think I don't remember being at that. And the truth is, I probably wasn't. Right. Yeah. Of course. Um, last question, really. Um, have you, and I always ask this question, have you ever taken someone to their first game? So, you know, your elder brother took you to that York Peterborough game. Have you done so for, you know, your wife, your children, you know, friends, whatever? Can, is there anything where you think, I've started this process for someone, I've managed to get them into, whether it be York City, Leeds, whatever? Yeah, absolutely. Um I know my wife had been to a few games, but during the time I was I was covering Sunderland um, in the, the the second half of the nineties, uh, she became a regular at the stadium with light, and then quite a few away games as well. Um, mm -hmm. So that became a thing. And then in more recent times, my daughter, who's seventeen now, um, I took her when she was I think she was either two or three. I took her to her first York game. Um, right. But she was more interested in the sweets uh, and Yorkie the yeah. Lion actually rather than okay. any of the actual action. Uh, and then she's become a regular attendee of York Games with me. But I did test her because she's 17, because she was born in 2007. Um, she has grown up with, obviously, football just being on everywhere in our house. It's never never off. Obviously, it's never off. So she she watches everything. And and not surprisingly, she's, she's grown up a Manchester City supporter. That's her big team because, well, why wouldn't you at this point? Yeah. Um it's like the Liverpool phenomenon when I was a kid. So um, so she's grown up supporting Manchester City. And I tested her out uh, three years ago. I tested her out um, because I had a, a rare Saturday free in November. And York were away to Curzon Ashton in the National League North, uh, where we'll probably be going again next year. I uh, thought we'd left that place behind forever. Yeah. So I said to her, right, OK, will you come to Curzon? Nobody, nobody's coming with Nobody wants to come with me. Will you come to Curzon with me next Saturday? And she was very, she was reluctant. She, no, I don't really want to, Dad, and all this sort of thing. I said, well, come on, Mum doesn't want to come. And it's my only, it's a day off. I'd like to go. Yeah. And we sort of did a deal. So the following, I said, right, I'll tell you what, I'll take you. And through some contacts, and I can't do this often. It's a bit of a myth. When people ask you, you'll know this, Richard, because you sort of work in football, people think you can mm. just get tickets and come oh, yeah. up. We never get offered tickets, never. We can't get them. We go through the same process as everybody else. But for once, I managed to pull in some favours and I got tickets for three of us to go the following week to Manchester City against Everton at the Etihad. Full hospitality. Um, so I, so she agreed to come with me to Curzon Ashton against York if the following week we'd, we'd all go to Man City. So fine, that was, that was a deal. We had a great day. It was a nil-nil draw. It was shocking. It was freezing. Yeah. Uh, the Atlas Bar at Curzon Ashton for the away supporters is a shed, right. uh, grandly named, but it's a yeah. shed. So I said, come on, I'll get you something to eat. 
So I, I asked the person serving there, what have you got? And basically they gestured to what they had, which were cans of Coca-Cola, cans of garlic, and some Mars bars. And that was it, really. Um, so basically bought one of each. Um, I had a drink of my beer and thought, that's a bit funny. When I look, it was about six months out of date <laughs> and, and, and semi-warm. It was this, rusting. But yeah, this does, <laughs> nobody's bought anything from here for a while. This doesn't bode well. But anyway, we had a real laugh. We saw a lot. I saw a lot of people I knew, lo loads of friends and, from from way back, and, and 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 I enjoyed it. It was despite the fact it was nil nil, and despite the fact that the Curzon curse, which has been, which is a York City thing, by the way, the Curzon curse. Oh, is it? Every time okay. we play away to Curzon Ashton, we're shocking, and the manager gets sacked. Okay. And that happened again on the way home in the car. We hear that Steve Watson <laughs> has been sacked. So it's happened again. But I had a, a thoroughly good day, despite all that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the following week, Manchester City 3, Everton 0. Good day enjoyed by all. They've, they've enjoyed the food and the drink, etc. Um, yeah. On the way back on the train, I said, watch this, watch this to my wife. And I just said, because I know what the answer will be. And I said, right, come on then, you've done the test. Where's it going to be? This is, your, this is your test now. Do you go down the red route or the blue route? Is it York or is it Manchester City? Which is it going to be? Um, I said, which, which did you enjoy more? And I was absolutely confident she was going to say, actually, Dad, I loved last week with you seeing the real football and going to Curzon. And she turned around and typical millennial, she said, oh, God, this place, anytime. Get fed, get a comfy seat, a heated seat. And, all. and she thinks that's what going to football is now all the hospitality stuff, which is, it sickens me and it upsets me. Yeah. And and so she's made a choice. She's, 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 she's Manchester City, but I will come out in her defence. She still does. Whenever I can get a chance to go to a York game, home or away, she will come with me. So Excellent. Th there is that. It's it's there. It's in there. It's in there. Yeah. And, but, and when York start rising again, Whenever when they play each other on a level footing, she'll have a choice to make. <laughs> exactly right. Um, brilliant. Okay, well, I think, you know, we've covered a lot of ground today. We've covered a lot of grounds, in fact. So it's 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 been absolutely fascinating going through it. And, and I have found, already doing this podcast, it you go off on lovely little tributaries of the main... Yeah. The main course, let's say, and and it, that's part of it. I think that that's the really enjoyable part of of just chatting to people who've got football in their veins. And you know, I wish you luck with your daughter, but I think you, you know York got to rise a little bit, and maybe Man City come off the top, and then, as you say, that it might be more equal. There may, there may be an perfect season when we're back down in National League North, and we get to go to Curzon Ashton again. We might end up going full circle. You never know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to to relive the curse and curse what, yeah. what could be better but guy i really appreciate your time today thank you very much is there one last thing which you think that is what got me into that is the one thing that i remember that actually pulled me in and has never let me go since yeah, I, I, I think i think we've already done it i, I think when yeah. i think back and it's not something that's occurred to me before it's the shoot league ladders and it's Shoot Magazine and Match Magazine and the kits, the kits, the colours, the flicking through and, and, you know, the posters on the wall that you have as a kid. And, you know, even now, and I shouldn't say this, I really shouldn't say this, but, you know, Match of the Day is my bread and butter and I love it dearly. I loved it better then. I liked it when I was allowed to stay up age seven, age eight, age nine. And even now, you know, I... I I record, I have it on series link, the ITV4 program, the Big Match Revisited, which goes back over the old Big Match programs. Yeah. And I absolutely love watching those. And I still say, and I, I'll say it to my bosses till I'm blue in the face at, at the BBC, please, let's get all the old Match of the Days on. There's a market for it. We can watch. We had a little thing of doing it, actually, during lockdown when I had to well, sing for I my do remember that, by the yeah, way. Yeah. And I had the great joy of going back through archives and, and we did the FA Cup Rewind programmes and the World Cup Rewind programmes. And they got phenomenally high viewing figures. And I think we can do more of that. I think there's a there's there's room. There's got to be room in the schedules to put the old Match of the Day programmes on from start to finish, unedited. You know what? you'll get a few hundred thousand to maybe even over a million watching those. I, I think there's nostalgia rules and I, 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 I still love looking back at all that.
Excellent. Yeah. And yeah, nostalgia. Sometimes it's overrated, but actually it's got so much great stuff there. And, and that's why there is nostalgia, because we're looking at stuff that engaged us and we loved. And it, it was quite, I think the thing was, it was quite rare. As you say, we're bombarded with stuff now. This was when, you know, every single morsel, you appreciated it. You savoured it because it wasn't there relentlessly every minute of every day of every you know week. And I think, um, and I think we've discovered there's definitely an offshoot from this. I love what you're doing with this, but there's a there's definite offshoot just to have a whole load talking about kits. There's nothing better than a football shirt. <laughs> absolutely, and I, I, the offshoot will be called. It started with a kit. Brilliant. We're there. We're in, Guy. Thanks very much. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Richard.